We are right now in the middle of a series um, that has to do with the relationship between Paul and Timothy. And we're focusing on the books of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. And so I have an opening question for you. What do these five statements have in common? Okay, I'm going to give you five statements. I'm going to see if you can figure out what they all have in common. You ready? First one. There is a secret knowledge available to certain believers in Christ. Second one. The human body must be severely punished to purge the inner sin. Sounds like a fun Sunday morning. (laughs) Number three. Jesus did not really come to earth in human form because God cannot inhabit matter. You getting there? Figuring out what's going on? Number four. If you... um, Quote me on any of these. I'm going to have to. Okay. Um, Number four. A person can continue to sin in their body as long as their soul is pure. You just keep doing whatever you want as long as your, your heart's right. Number five. Unless a person converts to Judaism, they cannot become a follower of Christ. Anybody? Okay. They're all false. Yeah, that's, that's one thing they have in common. What else? Yeah. So I just listed for you the five most common false teachings in the early church. The five most common false teachings in the early church. Secret knowledge is what they call Gnosticism. The uh, severely punishing the human body is asceticism. Jesus didn't really come to earth in human form. That's docetism. A person can continue to sin in their body as long as their soul is pure. This is a big one. Antinomianism. Yeah, I went to college. (laughs) And the fifth one about having to convert to Judaism before they become a follower of Christ is some people call it Judaizers or Jewish legalism. Five very common, very consistent false teachings in the early church, and all five of these were addressed by Paul and Peter and John and the New Testament writings to the churches. Within just like a couple decades of when Jesus was taken up into heaven, there's all these kind of crazy ideas about what it means to follow Jesus and secret knowledge and abusing your body. And like the problem was not only were these false teachings, but there were large groups of people that believed them. These were five strongly held positions by well-meaning people in the context of the early church. Do you understand that? These people really thought that this was true, that Jesus couldn't have come in human form because God can't inhabit matter. And of course you have to convert to Judaism before you can be a Christian because Jesus was a Jew, right? All five threatened to split the local churches. Did you know that? All five of these false teachings threatened to just tear apart local churches, to derail the gospel. And here's what we're learning, right? False teaching has been around for as long as the church has been around. False teaching in the church has been around as long as the church has existed. And so why do I bring this up to you? Besides trying to teach you about antinomianism and docetism and all the isms of the early church, what I'm trying to help us to grasp, what I'm trying to help us understand is the primary purpose, one of the primary purposes of Paul's writing to Timothy. He's trying to address these false teachings. He's trying trying to address these, these core issues that the church has begun to believe that have nothing to do with the true faith, nothing to do with the gospel. Okay, so let's fast forward 2,000 years because most of us We don't live with docetism or antinomianism or Gnosticism, right? We can understand. I think almost all of us in some way, shape, or form understood that those five statements were absolutely false. But what about some more common statements, some more common beliefs and teachings today that we might be tempted to give in to? How about things like uh, just follow your heart, right? I've heard really... Gracious and God-loving people just offer that kind of advice. Well, you know, just follow your heart. Well, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things, right? 
But we say, oh, just follow your heart. Here's another one for our common context. Maybe. Godly living will guarantee prosperity. Oh, I could spend a whole Sunday on that one, right? That if you just live rightly before God, that you're guaranteed a good life. Here's another one. God will never give you more than you can handle. Okay, friends, if I've had so many gracious, loving, compassionate people try to speak into my life in moments of utter pain that just say, oh, God's never going to give you more than you can handle. And I don't use foul language much. But, man, I just I want to use some words when I hear that because it's just not true. It's completely false. Like over and over throughout Scripture, there's men and women who put in these situations that they literally cannot handle. But then God comes through for them. Here's the last false teaching maybe you heard. If you just try a little bit harder, you can be right with God. We're not dealing with docetism and antinomianism or Gnosticism, right? We're dealing with these kinds of false teachings that seem just like they might be real. Just enough truth to get us to catch on to following your heart, prosperity gospel. God's never going to give you more than you can handle. See, here's the problem. This is probably the most significant reason why it is so important for us to pass on the true faith of what it means to follow Jesus to the next generation. Because for thousands of years, since the existence of the church, there have been examples after example of false teaching that creeps into the church, that creeps into the body of Christ. And it's happening even today. Thousands of years later, it is still happening. The church is struggling under these kinds of like sort of true, sort of hallmark card kind of ideas that are actually destroying the gospel. And last week, I I left you with this question. The final question I ask you is, who is your Timothy? Right? We've begun exploring the relationship between Paul, arguably, arguably one of the greatest missionaries to ever walk, this earth, right? The relationship between Paul and Timothy, the mentorship, the discipleship that took place. The question was, do you have a Timothy? Do you have someone that you are passing on the true faith to and helping them to sort through the false teachings that are out there? If so, have you ever talked to that person about how you've been impacted by false teachings in your own life? Have you ever shared your, your story in wrestling through some of the false teachings? This, this is why we're in the middle of this series, right? I, I believe that every generation has a responsibility to pass on the true faith to the next generation. And so I'm going to ask you one more hard question. If the future of our church was directly dependent on how you have shared the faith with the next generation, what would the church of tomorrow look like? I'm going to ask it again because I'm asking it of myself. If the future of our church, Cowdersport Alliance, was directly dependent on how you have shared the true faith of following Jesus with the next generation, if that was the direct impact on the future church, what would our church look like tomorrow? What would the future of our church look like? Think about this. For thousands, literally 2,000 years, faith in Jesus Christ has been passed from one generation to the next. And so I'll ask one more question. Isn't it? Isn't the future of our church based and directly impacted by, based on and directly impacted by what you pass on to the next generation? Isn't our future church dependent on the faith that you carry now that you pass to your Timothys and your Tituses? Isn't that what it means to follow Jesus? Here's the first statement I'm going to make today, and it's going to serve as the underpinning of everything else we discover in 1 Timothy this morning. And that is, what a church believes will directly shape how a church lives. 
What a church believes will directly shape how a church lives. If we believe in the importance of Scripture, we will read Scripture. If we believe in the value of the next generation, we will pour into that next generation. If we understand the power of prayer, we will pray regularly for each other and with each other. If we believe that giving of ourselves financially, spiritually, emotionally, relationally is part of what it means to be a follower of Christ, guess what's going to happen? Our checkbooks are going to look like it. Our calendars are going to look like that. Because what a church believes will directly shape how a church lives. And here's the problem as it relates back to Timothy. The church at Ephesus that that Timothy was helping to pastor at that time, it was riddled with false teaching. It had all of these lies that just kept popping back up. And it was adversely affecting the church. It was adversely affecting the next generation. It was wreaking havoc. It was just tearing the church apart. So that's at least one reason why Timothy is writing. So if you'll turn in your Bibles, we're going to go to 1 Timothy. Because in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul is very direct and very clear about the presence of false teaching in the early church, specifically in Ephesus. And Paul understood deeply the importance of passing on the true faith to the next generation. Remember who Paul's talking to, right? He's talking to Timothy, a young man. We know him to be timid. We know him to be sickly. We know him to be probably from a biracial home, potentially a single parent home. And you can imagine the amount of insecurity that a person would carry if that was part of their story. So Paul is writing to this young man who's trying to lead this church who is most likely riddled with all kinds of insecurities and the church itself is just tearing itself apart with false teaching. This is the setting. As we read in 1 Timothy chapter 1, would you pay attention with me about the way that Paul's story is impacted by the Jesus story, okay? Watch for that. There's really two stories going on right now. And these verses, these 14 verses, what we see is the way that Paul's story has been profoundly and irrevocably impacted by the Jesus story. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. Excuse me. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. Okay, so we know this story. You heard this last week, that Paul and Timothy spent probably at least two decades together sharing the truth of Jesus Christ, establishing churches. And at one point they were together in Ephesus. And Paul had to leave, but he installed Timothy as pastor, knowing, okay, knowing that that church was regularly dealing with these false doctrines, these false teachings. They needed someone who was going to pass on the true faith, right? And when you get to verse 4, Stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogy. So here's what's happening, right? There was this group of people that they were majoring on the minors, okay? There was a group of people in the church that took minor issues in the context of the scriptures, minor issues in the context of following Jesus, and they made them into major issues. And they got themselves caught up in like these, what they call myths or genealogies. What was happening, there's this group of people trying to figure out whose bloodline was better. Hmm. Hmm, Yeah. You know what that does to a church, don't you? (laughs) Group of people trying to figure out whose bloodline was better, whose whose teachings were more pure, whose family was more pure, who had more rights to, to lead in the context of the local church. And what happened is there's controversy and there's strife and bitterness comes up and everyone loses. And the gospel is stunted in the community. This is what was happening. They were just majoring on the minors. They were getting caught up in minor issues and turning them into major problems, right? But we know, put that in like context for just a second. Remember that Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy's leading the church at Ephesus. And remember in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, 
Paul is writing to Ephesus, and what does he say? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and not your own, not yourselves. It is the gift of God. Does that give you some context, right, of Ephesians 2? These, these people were getting caught up in like, well, my family is more important than your family, and, and, and I have this truth that nobody else has, so I, I, I should be able to lead. When you frame the situation that, that Timothy is facing in Ephesus with the verses that Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, he's trying to help them understand that salvation comes by grace through faith in Christ alone, not genealogies, not mythical beliefs, not secret knowledge, not hard work, not certain ways of doing things, but, but through Christ alone. This is the problem that... that was facing Timothy, and this is why passing on the faith to the next generation is so important, because what a church believes is how a church lives. And if a church believes that myths and genealogies and bloodlines are the important thing, it's going to come out in the way they live. And this is what was happening in Ephesus. Verse 5, Paul, okay, so this is halfway through verse 4, sorry. Paul continues, he said, such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. He's saying this, I want to translate this for you from from Greek to English. And uh, Lord, forgive me if this isn't true. But what Paul is saying, this is stupid. I I think, it's not in the Greek, but it's, it's, it's the JDV, Josh Dean version, right? Like, please don't ever look for one of those. But Paul's just saying, this is foolish. This is stupidity. Controversial speculations, right? They're majoring on the minors. They're tearing the church apart because they're talking about these myths and these genealogies and these family bloodlines. And Paul's just saying, as politely as he can, this is stupid. This is foolish. Why get caught up in that? Once again, how a church believes will shape how a church lives. So Paul's saying such such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. And then he goes on to compare their beliefs with the gospel, right? This is what Paul's doing. The goal of this command is, say it with me, love. The goal of this command is love which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith, right? Remember the words of Jesus in John 15, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love, Jesus says. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love, right? When you take love out of a church, when you take love out of the central purpose of a church, we expose ourselves to all kinds of risks for false teaching and controversy and strife and pain. 1 John 4, 7 and 8, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Right? Love is at the core of the gospel. Not genealogies, not myths, not bloodlines, not secret knowledge, but love. Love. Did you know, referring back to the book of Ephesians, right, that Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus where Timothy was the pastor, do you know how many times that Paul refers to love in just six chapters? 17 times in Ephesians. You see, the problem was the Ephesians church had an issue with love, with loving well, with loving each other, with loving God. 17 times in six chapters, Paul refers to love. That is the most concentrated amount of times that Paul uses the term love in any of his letters. Do you know that? The only other one is 1 Corinthians, you know, love is patient, love is kind, love is pure, right? That one's got 17 as well, but that's 16 chapters long. Paul is using the most concentrated amount of times that he's talking about love in any of his letters, trying to help the people of Ephesus understand that their false teaching has destroyed their love. The things that they believe have destroyed their love for each other, their love for God, their love for the community is just getting ripped apart. 
And then fast forward about 10 or 12 decades, go to Revelation chapter 2, the end of the Ephesus story as we have in Scripture. And in Revelation chapter 2, this is what John writes down as part of Revelation to the church of Ephesus. It says, I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary, and yet I hold this one thing against you. You have forsaken the... Mm. Mm. You've forsaken the love that you had at first. They were doing an awful lot of good things, right? Paul says it. John says it in Revelation chapter 2, right? They didn't tolerate wicked people. They tested those who claimed to be apostles and found them false. They've endured hardships. They've gone through hard times. But the problem was they stopped loving. They stopped loving God. They stopped loving each other. They stopped loving the next generation. They stopped loving the community. And Paul tells them why this happens. Paul makes it very clear. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Paul makes it very clear as to why. Because some have departed from these, that means the true faith, and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they don't know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. There's Paul using real good Greek again, right? This is so dumb. They've departed from, from the truth. They've turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law. They don't understand what they're talking about. Here's the problem. They've drifted away in their doctrine from the true faith. They've drifted away, and they're not passing on genuine faith to the next generation. Instead, they've been majoring on the minors, elevating lesser things to a greater issue in the context of the church which has led to misinformed and misplaced values in the context of the church. Why? Because what a church believes will directly shape how the church lives. What we believe in the core of our being about God's word or about prayer, about Jesus, or about faith, or about forgiveness, or about love, will shape how we live. Part of the problem was, let's go back to 1 Timothy 1, verse 8. Paul's talking about they're fighting over the law, right? Really, they're talking about the Old Testament, the genealogies, the history books, right? The law, this potential secret knowledge that only certain good Jewish people have, right? So Paul's saying, we know that the law is good, right? He's not throwing out the law entirely. He's not throwing out the Old Testament entirely. He's not dismissing all of the things that God did in the history of the Israelite people. But he's saying the law is good if one uses it properly. Right? They had elevated lesser things to a greater issue and lost the gospel. And therefore, they weren't using the law properly. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. Verse 9, we also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers. Okay, so Paul's going to get into some nitty-gritty stuff about what the law is for right here. Stay with me, okay? Don't get lost in what he's about to say. Understand the overall message. The right usage, right? We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers. He's saying the law is designed to help people who don't know Jesus to understand their need for Jesus. Does that make sense? And then he starts talking about lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and the irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers for murderers. Wow, I don't want to go to the Ephesus church. Um, verse 10, for those sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. Okay, understand something right now. Paul is talking about the way that the community of Ephesus was behaving Right? He's talking about a whole bunch of problems that were happening in the culture around them. Right? Lawbreakers and ungodly and sinful and unholy and irreligious. And, and I don't even know where that one about killing their fathers and mothers come from. But murderers and sexually immoral. Right? All, all of this was happening all around Timothy and the church in their community. These were behaviors they're actively being engaged in, right? 
Paul's saying that the law is to help them understand their need for a Savior, regardless of how bad it is. Can you think of anything worse than killing your own parents? Well, Paul is saying, regardless of how deplorable and ugly and awful the sin is, the law is there to point everyone to their need for a Savior. And what, for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine, he kind of puts a like, catch-all. Like anything else that you can figure out what's going on around there that isn't of Jesus, that's what the law is for, to show them their need for Jesus. Verse 11, that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God which he entrusted to me. There's that language again, right? There's that language that Paul uses often about trust and entrusting. So let's back up for just a second, right? Make sure we understand the context. We know that Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy is leading the church at Ephesus, and within the church of Ephesus, they have majored on the minors, and it is tearing the church apart. And one of the ways that they've majored on the minors is they've gotten real deep into the law, and they've forgotten about grace and love. That same grace and love which was entrusted to Paul to pass on to Timothy pass on to the next generation, to pass on to you and to me several thousand years later that we will then pass on to the future church. Paul's talking about being entrusted with the gospel. And then he starts kind of looking inwardly. Paul looks inwardly to his own journey. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. So there it is, trusted and trustworthy, right? It almost sounds like Paul's talking, like kind of getting ready to raise himself up and say, hey, take a look at me. Look at how trustworthy I am with the gospel. Look, how, look at how many great things that I've done. It feels like for just a minute, Paul's getting ready to puff himself up, right? He's thanking Jesus. You ever done that? Like humble brag? Oh, Jesus, I'm just so thankful that I'm as good looking as I am. Jesus, I'm just so thankful. I'm so humble. You know, like, right? We do this, right? And that's what it feels like. It feels a little bit like a humble brag, right? Jesus, I'm just so glad that you gave me enough money to bless everybody, right? It feels that's where Paul's going, okay? Let's just be honest. I'm thanking Christ Jesus for giving me strength. He considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, right? It sounds like he's about to lift himself up, but then Paul does this crazy thing. In the very next verse, Paul does this super unusual, doesn't make sense kind of thing. Verse 13, he starts talking about all of his brokenness. You know what Paul does? He starts... Instead of instructing Timothy from a position of strength, he instructs Timothy from a position of weakness. You see what he's doing? Rather than humble bragging, he's just dead honest. Verse 13, he says, Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Friends, if we're going to pass on a true faith to the next generation, it has to be grounded in our story. The whole story. The good, the bad, and the ugly of our past and our life before Christ. The next generation needs the whole story. And rather than Paul start bragging about all these amazing accomplishments, because at this point, he was nearing the end of his life. He had started so many churches. He had started this, like, what was becoming a worldwide movement. Paul was significantly responsible for all these different churches and all these different pastors and all these different books of the Bible that were being read throughout the Mesopotamian rim at that time, right? Like, Paul had done some amazing things, and rather than talk about those, what's he talk about? He talked about how messed up his story was without Jesus. He talked about how messed up his story was without Jesus in direct comparison to the genealogies who were trying to figure out, well, my, is my bloodline better than yours? Paul takes the humble route. He instructs Timothy from a position of weakness, not strength. He doesn't get into the fights over who's got a better family bloodline. He doesn't get into the fights over mysterious knowledge. He just owns his story, and then he shares his story. I mean, look at what he calls himself. He calls himself a blasphemer, a persecutor, violent, ignorant, unbelieving. 
And what Paul is saying here, get this, what Paul is saying is that what made him trustworthy was not his good story, but the grace and faith and love that Jesus poured out on him in the midst of his sin. That is what made Paul trustworthy, was the grace and mercy that was poured out in his life. And in so doing, what Paul is saying to us, he's basically saying, hey, if Jesus could save me, he could save anybody. If Jesus could redeem my story, he could redeem any story. So Paul is dead honest about his own journey, and who he was before Christ. Then verse 15, he goes on, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Notice that Paul doesn't say whom I was the worst. For those of us who have walked in in our relationship with Jesus for a long time, been a part of the church, it's real easy to go, I was. I was prideful. I was angry. I was, right? Here's Paul. 25, 30 years into his journey. From that moment he came to Christ on the Damascus Road, right? Three decades later, he's saying, I still am. Apart from Jesus, I still am the blasphemer the persecutor, the ignorant, the violent, the unbelieving. Paul is owning his story. And this one verse, right? This one verse I would encourage you to consider in comparison to John 3.16, right? It's the most famous verse in Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, right? Some of you do that over and over in your, right? This is Paul's version of John 3.16. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This is the core of the gospel. Who came? Jesus came. Why did he come? To save. Who did he come to save? Only those who are sinners. Not those with perfect genealogical bloodlines. Not those with secret knowledge not those who have earned their way into the kingdom. Christ Jesus came to save sinners, persecutors, blasphemers, violent, sexually immoral, broken, hatred, murderers. Paul gave the whole list. Paul's declaration, he's saying, He's very clear. It's present language. I am the worst of sinners. Not I was, not I used to be, but I am. And as the worst of sinners, he is most eligible for grace, and for mercy, and forgiveness. Okay, verse 16. Paul goes on to talk about this story, right? But for that reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners. Second time he says it. But for that reason, I was shown mercy that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. You see what Paul is saying? I'm gonna, I said it before, I'm going to say it again. If Jesus could save me, he can save anyone, says Paul. The worst of sinners has been made right with God through Christ Jesus. Notice this. No matter how long Paul is walking in his relationship with Jesus, no matter how important he becomes in the church, no matter how many different leaders he's raised up or pastors he's installed or churches he's started, Paul is never far from the cross. Paul is never far from the cross. He never gets too far from that moment. He never gets too far from that moment of trusting his life to the very Savior that he was trying to destroy. This is his journey. No matter how far Paul has come, he is never too far from the cross of Jesus Christ. Never. Last verse, verse 17 
Paul just kind of breaks out in the song almost, right? He says, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You can almost sing that right now. I'll get a couple guys up on stage and put a few chords to it. We'll got a song, right? Paul is literally just like exuberant because he's talking about the, the true faith, the gospel, and he just like breaks out in the song, To the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I can list five songs that have all that in it, right? Paul is just so excited. He's so passionate. And you know why? Because Paul understands that true faith means only one person gets the glory. Paul understands that true faith that will be passed on to the next generation, that true faith means only one person gets the glory. And that's Jesus. The King Eternal, the Immortal, the Invisible, the Only God that all the honor and all the glory forever and ever would come to Jesus alone. True faith means that only one person gets the glory, and it's Jesus. So what about for us as a church, okay? What about for our context a couple thousand years later? I want to say it this way. Empowering true faith, right? Empowering means to empower the next generation, to give it to the next generation. Powering true faith means sharing how your story has been impacted by the gospel story for God's glory. Yes, I came up with that one. I don't normally do those. But empowering true faith is, it means sharing with the next generation how your story has been impacted by the gospel story for God's glory. This is what true faith is about. Paul is just brutally honest about his own story. Did you see that? He still calls himself chief of sinners, right? The worst of the worst. He's honest about how his story has been impacted by the gospel story for God's glory. Because, because what a church believes will directly shape how a church lives. And Paul gives this honest, open, real account of his own story and how his good, bad, and ugly story has been beautifully impacted by the gospel, all for the glory of God. I want to go back to that question I asked you at the beginning. If the future of our church was directly dependent on how you have shared the faith with the next generation, what would the church of tomorrow look like? If it was directly dependent on the way that you have passed on your story, impacted by the gospel story for God's glory, what would the church of tomorrow look like? What would the church of tomorrow believe? What would the church of tomorrow, how would the church of tomorrow behave? Okay, as I close, I heard this phrase this week and it jumped out to me. Okay. The younger generations are looking for destiny. The older generations are looking to leave a legacy. Could the legacy of the older generation be helping the next generation discover their destiny in Christ? The younger generation, they're just looking for their destiny. Where am I supposed to be? Where where do I belong? What does God have for me in this world? And the older generation is going, is anybody going to notice when I'm gone? The younger generation is trying to find their destiny. The older generation is trying to leave a legacy. Dear friends, could our legacy be empowering the next generation to find their destiny in Christ? True faith. Here's my challenge to you today, okay? I'm going to leave you with this. Two things. One, there's, um, there's a sermon study guide I put out in the cafe that's there every week. If, if God's putting something on your heart, if God's stirring something in you about passing on the true faith to the next generation, spend some time doing that in this coming week. But the other thing, I didn't plan this, but I think Jesus did, okay? We've got a lunch after this. So here's my challenge to you. Can we practice this over lunch? Can we practice this telling our story and how it's been impacted by the gospel for God's glory to one other person 
that doesn't know your story yet? Could you just like lean into the awkwardness of that with me over lunch? Could you, could you maybe learn the name of somebody you don't know? Could you maybe sit at the table with somebody you wouldn't normally sit with? And here's what I'm going to ask you to do, okay? As you tell your story, you can do three painful things that have shaped your story in Jesus and three positive things that shaped your story in Jesus, okay? There's the framework for you. You want to give me a pastor appreciation gift? Do that over lunch today. Three positive impacts on your story in relationship with Jesus and, and three painful ones. And Share that with somebody that hasn't heard your story before.